Let's go to Isaiah, the 54th chapter. Isaiah 54. And for time's sake, I want to read verses 1 through 5. And I'll skip down to verse 17. And I promise to put this text in context because I realize I'm dropping you into the middle of drama <laughs> that's taken place in the lives of the children of Israel without you having the proper understanding. But for your understanding, before we dive into the scriptures, the children of Israel are in a place that was prophesied. And it is a painful place, but it is also a place of promise. Amen. What do you do when God speaks concerning your life and then shows you the painful parts? The prophecy for them being there wasn't given to them but it was given to their forefathers, Amen. namely Abraham, yes. that they would be a great people and a great nation, but there's some darkness and greatness. You can never be great unless you're willing to endure the darkness that is a part of the journey for your greatness. Amen. And so here they are now according to the word that God gave to Abraham, that they would be in a place of exile, in a place of darkness, in a place of uncertainty. But that same place is filled with promise. Amen. That's good. <laughs> and so when we're reading this text, we are picking it up in process prior to Isaiah 54. Isaiah is trying to encourage the children of Israel by showing them what their future looks like. And so in order for them to get to that destination, that future, they have to make a decision. And this is where we find ourselves in the scripture. And so the first verse is a decision. Sing, O barren. Y'all don't want to have church tonight. <laughs> Sing, O barren. That's a decision. I'm, I'm barren, but you're asking me to sing? I'm hurting, but you want me to sing? Are you serious right now? All hell's breaking loose, but you talking about some sing? Sing what? Sing, O Barry. Thou that did not bear. So now you want me to sing even though nothing has manifested? Oh, Lord, have mercy. You're going to describe my pain and then ask me to sing about it? Sing, O Barry. Thou that did not bear. Then you're going to amp it up, cry loud. <laughs> Break forth into singing. <laughs> Thou that did not travail with trial. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife. Can you see the, par the paradox in this? In the okay, I can't, I can't get, we'll, we'll get there in a second. So for more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife. Okay, come on, y'all. Let's this wouldn't that Bible study. I'm sorry, y'all just gonna have to work with me tonight. Amen. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife. In other words, he's saying to them, you have it, it's just in process. Uh, y'all gonna fight me tonight. So since you have it, here's what I want you to do enlarge your tent 
come on Wednesday night Bible study, and let them stretch forth the curtains of your habitation. Amen. Spare not. Amen. Lengthen thy cords. Strengthen thy stakes. I could just preach right there, but that's not my assignment tonight. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left. Come on, get in the room with me tonight. I'm going to break forth not just on my dominant side, but also on my non-dominant side. I'm going to break forth in what I'm good at, and I'm going to break forth at what I'm struggling at. I'm going to say it over here to this side to some people who want to have church. I'm going to break forth in what I'm good at, and then I'm going to break forth in what I'm struggling at. <laughs> For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed, neither be thou confounded. Look at somebody and say, don't be confused, don't be confused. God is not the author of confusion. He says, neither be thou confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame. This is the part I love. For thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth. You, you mean to tell me that God could do something so powerful in my life that I will have to delete parts of my history? <laughs> For thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth and shalt not remember the reproach of thy widowhood anymore. For thy maker is thy husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. Now I want you to skip down to verse 17. No weapon <laughs> that is formed against thee shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise up against thee in judgment, watch this now, thou shalt come down. Ooh, Lord have mercy. Thou shalt, I ain't even going to say nothing. This is God talking. I'm not even going to say nothing. You're going to condemn it. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. For the next few moments we have together, I want to talk to you about the promise in process the promise in process. Let's pray. Spirit of the living God, we thank you for another divine moment, a strategic time that you have reserved for us to hear a word from you. The word is the only thing that can separate soul from spirit. So Father, we ask that you speak such a word to us today that it changes our very nature, that it causes us to be conformed to the image of your son, Jesus. May we be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Touch our hearts so it's open to receive it and on our ears that we're able to hear it. Holy Spirit, have your way in this place. Do as you will. All I ask is that none of us leave the way we came. In Jesus' name, somebody say amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I, I want to talk to you tonight about a promise in process. We often talk about the promises of God. The promises of God are yes, and they are amen. Meaning there is no ambiguity in between what God promised and what he does. God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. If he said it, then you can count it as good. <laughs> when God says a thing, that thing has to come to pass. The reason is, is because God is one with his word. When the Bible says that God is holy, it, it is not saying that, that God is, is, is wearing clothes that covers all of his skin. <laughs> okay, 
Uh, in other words, in other words, it, 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 I grew up doing the holiness, holiness Pentecostal uh, movement, and in the holy Pente Pentecostal denomination, you had to cover all of your skin because they made holiness a dogma rather than a disposition. In other words, they put holiness into their doctrine as something that ought to be did rather than something that ought to be lived. The word holy means to be one with, fully integrated with. So when God says, I am holy, therefore be holy, he's saying, I am one with my word. I cannot separate myself from my word. So much so that when my thought took on flesh, I had to forsake the flesh of the thought of the incarnation of my own son because I'm that integrated to my word. And when his flesh took on sin, I had to disconnect because I'm too integrated with my word. God is one with his word. And because he is one with his word, then his word has to stand. The psalmist says that God will not alter the words that comes out of his lips, which is why God is careful about speaking. And we can see this in scripture that he had a period of 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament when he ain't saying nothing to nobody. <laughs> uh, between your Bible, when you turn your Bible over from Malachi, all right, or as my grandmother used to say, Malachi, when you turn your Bible over from there and you flip over into Matthew, it's 400 years of, of a lapse of time where God is not speaking to nobody because his word is too powerful. And so because he is one with his word, when he says he's going to do a thing, he's going to do a thing. If the promises of God are yes and amen, it, it, it means that God has already said yes, but the amen is on us. Meaning that I have to get into agreement and in alignment with what God said yes to. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Uh, if God said he's about to open a door for you, then I wouldn't be stuck in the house right now. If, if, if God said he's about to make a way out of no way, I would be standing over the horizon with my, with my eyes like that, looking for the way that he is about to make. If God has, has spoken to you, like I was saying when we got up here and almost just prophetically, I felt that unction to lift your hands because God, God said it's, it's, it's on the way and you have and you're about to receive it. And, 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 and some of y'all were looking at me like I had five heads standing up here. You, you have to understand you got to participate with what God has promised in your life. And if you do not participate, then the promises lie dormant, but still have their power to be pick back up because there is no expiration date on the promises of God. They're just waiting for your participation. Peter says that, 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 that we have th this, 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 this promise, this, this incorruptible thing that, that cannot rust. The word of God is incorruptible and it cannot rust and it is reserved in heaven for you. Wow. And so, and so when we talk about promises, we, we're really talking about seeds. The reason I say that is because everything begins with a seed. A seed is a promise. So when God says, I, when God says, I'll make you the head and not the tail, that is a seed, which is a promise. Because right now you might be the tail and not the head yet. But he says, I'll make you. Come on Wednesday night, Bible study. He said, don't worry about it if you're not there, I'll make you. You just missed it. He didn't say, I'll send you to the head. He says, I'll make you the head while you are the tail. You didn't hear what I just said. So while you're lagging behind, I'm making you the head 
while you are where you are doing what you're doing, struggling how you're struggling, I'm making you the head right where you are. And because you don't feel like you're the head, because you don't feel like you're more than a conqueror, you think the promise is not in process. The moment he said it, it started. Come on, come on, come on. The moment he said it, it started. I don't, have, I don't have time. I don't have time to go there. I don't have time to go there. But I was going to show you that this in Genesis one, but I don't have time to go there. You know, in Genesis one, it, when darkness upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God hovered over the waters, and God said, "Let there be light." The promise was in process. <laughs> so the moment God says it, it starts. Okay. So everything starts with a seed. Everything in your life begins with a seed. <laughs> a flower is a seed. An avocado started with a seed. Your belief system, whether open or closed, rigid or flexible, began with a seed of somebody telling you something that formed the, 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 the strands of the thoughts that you started to have consistently, which created your system. And that's why you believe the way that you believe. A flourishing business began with the seed of an idea and a concept. Life starts with a seed. Whatever you see manifested in the world in your life began as a seed, which through time, and reinforcement from internal and external sources begin to germinate, take root, and grow. Everything starts with a seed. Stay with me, I'm going somewhere with this. Do you recall Jesus said in Matthew's gospel, the 13th chapter, he, he said these words, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. Amen. Mm -hmm. He said, he said, which a person took and sowed in a field, and it's the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is the biggest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air can come and shelter in its branches. Think about that for a second. Jesus is trying to describe the kingdom of God, which was a promise. And he says, I want you to see it as a seed. But I don't want you to see it as any old kind of seed. I want you to see it as a mustard seed. Because I want you to see it as the smallest thing possible. Oh, uh, Lord have mercy. The reason I want you to see it as the smallest thing possible uh, is because I need you to understand the ability of God to take something this big and create something that gigantic. And what you have to understand about it is that the tree was in the seed. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. You look at the tree, how big it is, but its beginning was this big. And so the manifestation of, of what was here is now that gigantic that the birds of the air can come and you know how high that is that the birds of the air can come and nest in it. But, 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 but we're so fixated and we're so focused on this part. A seed. A mustard seed. Stay with me. A mustard seed is a very small and insignificant thing. And he says, the kingdom of God is like that. <laughs> it was Pliny the elder who, who said he was a contemporary of Jesus Christ. And he wrote in an encyclopedia book uh, called Natural History, in which he describes all plants that were known in the Mediterranean world during that time. And he says two main things about the mustard plant that we have to understand. Number one, it's medicinal. And number two, it's a weed that cannot be stopped. Come on, stay with me. Come on, stay with me. I'm going to bless you tonight. Just stay with me. He says, number one, it's medicinal. And number two, it's a weed that cannot be stopped. 
So when Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like, a, is like a mustard seed, he was saying there's healing in it, but there's also a contradiction in it at the same time because it's a weed that cannot be stopped. So once it starts, you cannot stop it from growing because it's not a normal plant. The reason it is not a normal plant is because it can live in all environments. It's hard to take out. Just look at somebody and say, he ain't talking about trees, he's talking about you. If you are part of the kingdom, I just told you that you are hard to take out. And that when you get injured, you already have the medicinal power on the inside of you to take a licking and keep on ticking, baby. I feel this thing coming on in the room. Come on, let's teach, let's teach, let's teach, let's teach. So, 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 that's powerful. That God would liken his kingdom to, to a weed. <laughs> I, I can't go there, I can't go there, I can't go there. And so I gotta stay on task, I gotta, this, this thing is speaking to me, it's just speaking to me. And, and, and so, and so, and so, he, he said, Pliny said this, he said, listen, it's medicinal and it's a weed that cannot be stopped. It's mustard is a pungent taste and a fiery effect, but it's extremely beneficial for your health. It grows entirely wild, though it is improved by being transplanted. So every time the mustard seed is transplanted, it grows stronger. Come on, come on. So every time something moves you, it doesn't weaken you, it strengthens you. That's why everybody around you is confused because they know how much you've been moved back and forth to and fro, and yet you still got your praise, and yet you still got your ability to thank God, and yet, come on, I gotta teach, I gotta teach. I'm going to keep this iPad in my hand so that I don't go crazy. <laughs> so, 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 that's powerful. He says, but on, on the other hand, when it has once been sown, watch me now, it is scarcely possible to get the place free of it. Because the moment a mustard seed falls, it germinates at once. Unless a seed falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it germinates at once. Meaning you cannot stop it from coming up from under the ground and bursting out through the dirt and growing to the height it's supposed to grow. That's why when Jesus was crucified, Lord have mercy, and his body came off the cross, the whole earth shook because the seed was going into the ground and once that happened, it could not be stopped. Just look at three or four people and say, you can't be stopped. You can't be stopped. When you got a promise from God, you cannot be stopped. I dare you to find somebody who halfway look like they want to be in a Wednesday night Bible study and say, because you got a promise from God, can't nothing stop you. Can't nobody take what God has for you. Your destiny cannot be retrofitted into somebody else's life. In other words, what God has for you is for you. 
So, so, so. With that understanding then, why then do we pray for the end result of what God promised, but have no conversation or want for the process of what he promised? Yeah, buddy. <laughs> we pray for the end result of what God promises. But the problem with that is, is that God then answers you with a seed. So, so, so you, you pray for the job or you pray for the relationship or, or you pray for the healing, but then God answers with a seed. <laughs> and he answers with a seed that is born out of our petition. So, in other words, we ask God for the oak tree, and then God makes acorns show up around your feet. You're looking at the acorn talking about, I asked for the oak tree. And God is going that the oak tree is in the acorn. How many promises then have you probably stepped over because they showed up in the embryonic stage of a seed. How many opportunities have you missed? How many relationships have you had not had that you did not have because you was looking for the oak tree and God sent the acorn? <laughs> come on, baby. Come on, come on, I got it for you. We all do it. We, 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 we all do it. Peter was in the boat with Jesus, and, 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 and Jesus uh, said, uh, put, put, put your nets out on the right side, plural nets. And, and he couldn't do it because he's a professional. This is what I do for a living, and you're not going to come up here and tell me I've been out here all night long. I didn't catch nothing. And, and furthermore, it's just me and you, and I don't have my crew, and we need more bodies to handle the weight of the nets because if I throw this net out there and I just washed and cleaned, it's going to be expensive if I lose it if something does get caught in there and you don't have the strength and power to pull this thing in. And Jesus is looking at him like, boy, if you don't throw them nets out there, I don't know. I'm <laughs> and so what Peter said was, nevertheless, at thy word, right? So, so, so at thy word, I'll throw out my net. But Jesus said nets, so he didn't trust that the promise was in process. He still caught something, but what he caught, he couldn't handle. Stay with me, I'm going somewhere with this thing. So, so I, I said all of that to get you to the place of understanding because when we enter into this text, it requires some discernment on how God does what he does. And all that getting, get understanding. Wisdom is the principal thing. And so as as we understand this concept of discernment, I want us to realize that discernment is not the same as decision making. Stay with me. Because as we enter into this text, we're entering into this text having to make a decision. But that decision is going to be based on our discernment. Stay with me. So, 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 so discernment is not the same as decision making. Reaching a decision can be straightforward, it can be quick. You, you, you make tens of thousands of them every day that you wake up. You consider your goals, you consider your options, and you list your pros and cons, and you look at what's possible with each one, so forth and so on. But discernment doesn't work like that. Discernment, on the other hand, is about listening and responding to that place within us where our deepest desires align with God's desire. In other words, we, we sift through our impulses and our motives and options to discover which ones lead us closer to him or further away from him. Which ones lead us closer to his love or further into our anger. See, discernment reveals new priorities. 
Whenever you have discernment, you're gonna have a different set of priorities. Something is about to change in your life. Something is gonna be more essential, some things are gonna be less essential. You have new directions. You no longer want to go the old way. You no longer want to do the old things. You no longer want to have the old habits because whatever you do habitually will always have the power to defeat what happens occasionally in your life. I'm gonna say that one more time because that one is free. Whatever you do habitually will have the power to defeat what happens occasionally in your life. If you work out habitually four or five days a week, the occasional piece of cheesecake ain't gonna get you. Conversely, <laughs> on the other hand, if you eat cheesecake four or five times a week and then work out one time, your habit is going to defeat your occasion. Discernment reveals new priorities, directions, and discernment reveals the promises of God. Ugh. When you come to realize that what previously seemed so important, like your problem, compared to what God promised. When you come to realize that what God promised is way more important than the situation and the circumstance that you're in the middle of right now. I hear you, Lord, I hear you, Lord. And, and the situation and the circumstance to you seems like it has so much power but you have to discern, you have the ability to discern what you're going to decide to do and believe because you have a promise. Because I have a promise, I get to decide whether or not this problem or this predicament is going to stop me from being in pursuit of what God promised. And typically and usually, what halts me from making the right choice and decision is the process sometimes is terrible. Can I talk to somebody in here? It is terrible. Yes, you're gonna get free from the Egyptians, but you're gonna be in the desert for a while. Yes, they're going to give you the gold and change your economic situation in 24 hours. But in a little while, you're going to find yourself with your back on the corner having to trust God again. The promise, stay with me, does not alleviate trust. Regardless if it manifests or not, I'm still going to have to trust in the Lord with all my heart and lean not on my own understanding and in all my ways acknowledge him and he will make my next path straight. Amen. In other words, it, it, it doesn't stop. There is no such thing as I have arrived to the promises of God. <laughs> the promises of God it's not a destination, they are a process. Y'all don't want to talk back to me. Y'all don't want to talk. Because you think the moment you get that promise that there ain't going to be no more process. Mm -hmm. my, 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 my daughter uh, had an unusual birth. And by unusual, I mean we didn't make it to the hospital. My, my wife calls me, I'm at work, and she says, I'm going into labor, so I leave work, and I'm, you know, all the husbands know what I'm talking about. And I'm flying, and I get to the house, and my wife is in labor, so I call the midwife. And uh, the midwife is assuring me that I have all this time. <laughs> I'm describing to her what's happening 
the minutes of the contractions, what's going on, and she goes, oh, you got hours. I said, I don't think so. <laughs> I, I, I said, my wife looks completely uncomfortable. She, she, she looks like she is about to go really into labor. She's grunting, she's pushing, and the midwife goes, that's normal, it's fine, you got hours, take your time. I said, all right, and I hung up the phone. My wife wanted to get in the bath, I got her in the bath, and once I got her into the water, something happened. Amen. Her stomach went from here to here. Amen. It dropped, which means that the baby dropped. When she got out of the bath, she starts bearing down and pushing in the bathroom, and I'm going, stop. As if she got some control. And I'm like, stop, what you doing? Hold on, don't push. And she started pushing. I run back on the, in the room, I grab the phone, I call the midwife back, and I say, hey, she is pushing, this baby is coming. I don't know, she, she said, that's not possible. And she said, that's not possible. I, I said, I'm telling you that she is in the middle of the hallway and the baby is coming. She is pushing, she is grunting, and the midwife going, that's not possible. And I said, you know what? You're not here. You don't see what I see. You're not experiencing what I'm experiencing. And I'm telling you, it's coming. So I said, I tell you what, I'm going to hang up this phone. I'm going to call 911 because this baby is on the way. And the midwife said, no, Mr. Phillips, you don't have to do that. I am a professional and I have been doing this for over 30 years and I can tell you that she is not about to give birth. I said, well, you can take all of your expertise and it's gonna be trumped by my experience at this moment. God bless you, goodbye. And I got, and I got on the phone and I called 911 and my daughter starts coming out. So here I am on the phone looking at my wife having this baby and then realize that she can't sit there and do it by herself. So I run over there, of course, I would like to act like I was as cool as I'm talking to you right now. But what I really was doing was, oh, Jesus, 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 I don't know if it was tongues, I don't know what it was, but I... <laughs> and and my, my daughter, my daughter is delivered in my hands. She's delivered in my hands. And, and when she came out, she had the uh, umbilical cord wrapped around her head and she wasn't breathing. I don't know what prompted me to do what I did but I just did it. I took the cord off, I flipped her over, and I started patting her back, and I got all of that stuff out of her, her mouth, and my baby girl started, you know, yeah, yeah, like that, and we all said, ooh, thank you, Jesus. But to this day, she has a little indentation on her head, and every time I see her, I am reminded of the promises of God in my life because my baby girl who came out not breathing is, is breathing. I wish I had somebody. Why did I tell you that story? Because I believe tonight there are some people in this room who have not held their baby yet and you are fearful that it's not going to come out. But guess what? There's a push happening right now in the spirit and your baby, your promise, whatever it is, it's on the way. And so while my wife was pushing, and I was going, Jesus, 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 Jesus. My wife said, stop doing Jesus, 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 Jesus. And so I started singing. I can't even sing for real. 
I ain't going to offend you, but you know, I can't blow nothing. And I started singing and, and everything started getting peaceful. And so the text says to a people who feel barren and feel lost because what God promised has not materialized yet. And the first thing the prophet said to them was sing, O barren. Look at your name and say, baby, I got to get this tune out. I got a hallelujah down in my spirit that I've been holding back because of my predicament and my circumstance and my problem. But I got to go ahead and take a couple of minutes and just say hallelujah and give God praise for what he is about to do. Single bearing. Thou that did not bear. Cry loud, break forth into singing. Thou that did not travail. What? Because many are the children of the desolate than are the children of the married husband. And so Israel is being depicted here as a woman who cannot have children. The entire nation of Israel, as a metaphor, is being shown here as, as a woman who cannot have children. And of course, in that patriarchal system, that, that, that was a point of shame. So she's barren, she's isolated, she's divorced, she's wounded, and nothing is happening. And the prophet comes and says to them, sing. The reason he comes and says to, to, for them to sing was because prior to Isaiah 54, he began to describe the seed. God, I wish I had somebody in here. He begins to describe the seed. He, he begins to tell them that a stem is going to grow out of the root of Jesse. And he shall have no comeliness, no form amongst them. And, and he will be led to his shears and will be dumb. He's telling them about the seed. He's telling them that he's going to be wounded for your transgressions and bruised for your iniquities. And the chastisement of his peace is going to be placed upon you. And with every strike that goes on his back, you're going to be healed. Just like the mustard seed. I wish I had somebody in here. He's trying to explain to them the reason why you can sing right now is because your promise is in process because the seed is on the way. Lord, they try to sleep on me tonight. Come on here, come on. Do you hear what I'm saying? So he tells them about the seed before he describes the promise. And he's saying to them that the reason why you ought to sing, though you're in exile, though things were destroyed, though everything in your life that you knew was deconstructed, these are people who were taken out of their homes, who lost everything who saw Jerusalem burned down to the ground and was now taken into captivity by the Babylonians. And now the prophet is saying to them, I want you to sing right where you are because the seed that was promised to your forefather Abraham is already on the way. The seed that was promised to the woman that will crush the head of the serpent is already on the way. And if the seed is on the way, then that means the promise is on the way. Your promise is in process. So there is some decisions I have to make while my promise is in process. The first thing I have to do is break out of my emotional state, lean into it because my emotions are real, acknowledge them, but break out of my funk because of all of the flux and uncertainty around me. And one of the fastest ways to break out of that is to sing, literally to open your mouth and to start singing. When you start singing, it breaks the emotional strand that has a hold of you. So when you feel down, you can actually start singing and it will lift your emotions to the point that what you were feeling, you don't even feel no more. That's why music soothes the savage beast. Now, if a song can do that, what could a praise do? 
If just any song could lift your spirit, what could a praise do? Because my Bible says God inhabits the praises of his people. He starts looking around for where the noise is coming from and then sits down and take resident on whoever's giving him glory. I don't even know how you can sit there right now and act like you don't understand that the words are coming out of my mouth. The moment you start praising, the moment he shows up. I just said a thing. The moment you start praising, it's the moment he shows up. I hear you, Holy Ghost. Let me tell you why your praise is so important. And this is not even my message, this is free. But I want to tell you right now why your praise is so important. You see, you have to understand that our adversary, he's the prince of the power of the air. And so when you're praying about your promise, your prayers can be captured in the atmosphere. Daniel was seeking God for an answer and the angel was on his way with the answer, but he was held up by the prince of Persia and he was fighting, but he had the answer. The moment Daniel prayed it, God sent the answer, but the answer was held up because it was a petition, a prayer request. The devil cannot stop praise. It is the only thing that can jump over the firmament and go right to the heaven's gate. My God, I wish I had somebody in here. He cannot stop God from getting to you the moment you start praising. Lord, have mercy. I dare you take 20 seconds and give him glory right there. You got a decision to make. And your decision is real simple. I'm gonna bless the Lord at all times. And his praise shall continually be in my mouth. I ain't there yet, but I'm gonna bless him anyway. Ah, uh, the deal ain't done yet, but I'm gonna bless him like it's done. I'm gonna praise him on credit like I know he's already good and his word is sure. So he says, the first thing you have to decide to do is are you going to focus on your praise or are you going to focus on your predicament? And so I'm going to use praise as a weapon to loose me from the pressure of my predicament so that I am not distracted. So I'm clear when I have to make the next decision. Somebody shout the next decision. The next decision I have to make then is to start making room for what God promised. So it is a radical idea to start enlarging your tents when you don't see nothing coming. So now I have to move from praise to faith. Come on, stay with me. Be, be, because the reason I have to do that now is because I praise God not for what he's going to do. I just praised him for who he is. That, that was the prescription of my praise. I didn't praise God because he was about to give me something. I praised him because he is something. He is the I am that I am. He is Alpha and Omega. He is Jehovah Jireh. He is Jehovah Sick Canoe, my banner. He is Jehovah Shalom, my peace. He is, he is El Elyon. He is El Shaddai. He is. So I praise him for who he is. But I start making room by faith because of what he can do. If I know who he is, then why wouldn't I move toward what he can do? So enlarge your tents. I got to start making room for what God can do because I have limited him to my predicament and made him small because of my problem. It was A.W. Tozer who said the solution to 10,000 problems is your view of God. 
If you can change your view of God, you can change all the problems you have right now. Because my God is a big God. Uh, now unto him, my God, I feel the power of the Holy Ghost. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you ask or think. According to the power that works in you. So I will not limit God to a bad year that I had. I will not limit God to a bad day. I will not look at God and say a bad day or a bad year equates to a bad life. The devil is a liar. It was just a bad moment and it was one small blip as it relates to the entirety of what God is going to do in my life. And so I have to enlarge my tents. I have to lengthen my cords. I have to strengthen my stakes. It is a radical idea to do such a thing, to enlarge your tent, lengthen your cords, and strengthen your stake when everybody know around you, you ain't got nothing coming. It's, it's the equivalent of Noah building the ark when it ain't never rained before. So you have a precedent of God asking somebody to do something that has never happened. And I hear the Lord say, <laughs> he's about to do something in your life that has never happened before. I wish I had 10 people who believed the words that were coming out of my mouth. My God, I thank you, Holy Ghost. God is about to do something that has never happened before in your life. Come on, I'm almost there, I'm almost there. And so, it's a radical idea to strengthen your, to, to enlarge your tents, lengthen your cords, and strengthen your stakes. It's, it's, it's radical because it, it, it relates to the fundamental nature of something, that God will come and ask you to do something that is really uh, uh, an oxymoron, that is a, a paradox that is contradictory to your plight. I'm barren, I'm tired, I'm frustrated. You want me to sing and you want me to start getting ready for something I don't have? Yes. The reason I want you to start getting ready is because you're gonna break forth on the right and you're gonna break forth on the left. So, so I'm, I'm going to take what you're good at, if you're right-handed and it's your dominant hand, or if you're left-handed and it's your dominant hand, either or, I'm going to take what you're good at, left or right, and I'm going to bless that. But then the most powerful thing I'm going to do is I'm going to bless you in the areas that you struggle in the most so that you have balance in your life. And oh, Lord, have mercy. And you're not worried about the next process. Wow, wow. And so he says to them, sing. I'm just teaching the text. I'm not even, I'm just teaching the text. Sing, O Baron. Strengthen your cords. Lengthen your stakes. I, 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 you're going to break forth on the left. You're going to break forth on the right. Watch it now. And your seed shall inherit the Gentiles and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Now, the reason he said this to them was because they didn't want to make a life where they were. In other words, uh, Jeremiah had to come along and tell them, seek the blessing of the city because if the city prospers, you'll prosper. They didn't think they were going to be there that long. But they were. So the Lord had to come and tell them, your seed is going to inherit all of these desolate cities. So they were praying for deliverance, but God was working on delivery. Yeah. Okay, you missed that. They wanted out, God wanted in. They wanted the pushing, the birthing to stop like I did, don't do that. 
Because this is not the place you give birth. So God is giving birth in a place that's not suitable for birth. <laughs> I'm preaching better, y'all shall. And so, and so watch this. And so watch this. He says to them, your seed is going to inherit all of this. It's no need for you to pray to get out. The reason they wanted out was because it was a protracted season of difficulty. It was long. 70 years? I got to be here for 70 years? You promised me. Amen. And God is saying to them, no, no, no. I, I, this is generational. Your children are going to be blessed from this. <laughs> he, 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 he says to them, while you're worrying about all of that, I'm working on your history while I birth your destiny. Because when I get done, you're not going to remember the shame of your history. What you feel right now, this anxiety that you feel, this pressure that you feel about where you are, you ain't even going to remember that. When I birth your destiny. And so I need you to praise me. I need you to make room. I need you to start preparing. I need you to start getting ready. I need you to make some decisions. What you cannot do is sit there and do nothing. because you cannot afford to do nothing. Amen. You cannot sit here right now at this time in society and wait to see how things gonna turn out. You cannot sit here and be talking about some, I can't wait to get back to normal. No more ain't coming back. Come on now, make it plain. So you're praying to get back to a place that don't exist. It's, it's almost like Lot's wife turning around. Jesus. Lot's wife turned around and turned into a pillar of salt, not because God wanted to punish her, it was because she was trying to go back to something that wasn't there. Yes. Y'all don't want to talk back to me. Y'all want to talk back to me. Y'all don't want to talk. It was already gone, and she turned into what was not there, which means she was not there. Jesus. You see, Lot ain't turned around. Because when God says move, you got to move. And I can only imagine Lot did one of these numbers. Dag, babe, I'm sorry. I got to get that. <laughs> you got to move right now. You can't be sitting on your hands and talking about God when it's going to happen. It's going to happen now. Start lifting your cord. Start strengthening your stakes. Start enlarging your tent. Start preparing. Start getting ready. Sit down. Write the business plan. Write the vision. Make it plain so that when men are running, they can read it. I wish I had somebody in here. You got to start getting ready to do whatever it is you're going to do next now. And sing while you're doing it. And realize that what God has for you to do has the power to affect generations. Amen. I'm almost there, I'm almost there, I'm almost there. I'm almost there, I'm, I'm, I'm about done. And so he says to them, for thy maker is thy husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. He's letting them know, no ordinary person told you what's about to happen. I can see if Chauncey and them came down to your house. you like, who Chauncey and them? I don't know. I just made up the name. I, I can see if Ray and them and Chauncey and them or Cheryl or whoever, Lucy came down to your house and was like, girl, let me tell you something. God's about to do this in your life. And you sitting there with purse looks like, mm-hmm, that's right. Or some person that you relied on who told you they were going to do a thing never did it. And, and therefore, you are equating God's word to their word. God is not a man. I can flat out stop right there and not have to preach no more tonight. That's where he is not a man. So whoever let you down, it wasn't God. 
My Lord have mercy. Whoever disappointed you, it wasn't him. So, so, here, here, here's, how, here's how he caps the whole thing. Here's how he caps the whole promise that's in process. A, a process is simply stages and steps that get you to the next desired point until the manifestation of what was promised is seen. So I'm gonna say that again. It is stages and steps, okay, over a desired set of time, okay, that gets you to the next point until the manifestation of what was promised is seen, okay. So since he has their promise in process, because the seed that he's talking about is not going to come for another 750 years. Oh, Lord Jesus. <laughs> it got real quiet. <laughs> They're like, thank you, Pastor. Ain't nobody asked you all that information. <laughs> so, so while he has their promise in process, he's telling them to make room for what is coming and for the life they're going to have. And that, and that their predicament is not so bad because there's purpose inside of the place that they're in. And that when it's all said and done, there's gonna be such a generational blessing that their seed, their children will be able to inherit all of this space. Meaning that God sent them to a place, Lord have mercy, as captives, but they left as conquerors. Oh, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> so now, because of the process that's taking place with the promise, uh, it, every miracle you've ever seen manifested is a process. Miracles are processes that's been sped up. When Jesus did the first miracle, the first miracle, and by the first miracle, I mean it is the precedent of all miracles. It, it is when Jesus did the first miracle as he turned water into wine. Are you with me so far? It, 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 it was a process that he did that was sped up. And, and, and what you have to understand is that a part of, part of wine making in and of itself is going to include water at some point. Y'all not here with me. And so what, what he did was he sped the process up. He, he, just, he just took some steps out of it and said, go ahead, let me just speed that up and go ahead and turn the water into wine. And, and, and so the power of that miracle is not the water turning into wine. The power of any miracle is that once it's turned, it can't go back to what it normally was. So when God does something in your life, Lord have mercy, that is miraculous, there is no going back. So I'll close this, I'll close it like this. So now, these people are worried about their future. And they're worried about setting down roots in the place that's not even fit for giving birth. And the Lord, I left parts out of it because I thought it would, I thought it would mess us up so bad that I couldn't get to this last part. But I feel the Lord saying, go ahead and share this part with you. Because watch this, he says to them in verse eight, Lord have mercy. He says, in a little wrath, I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness, will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy redeemer. For this is as the waters of Noah unto me. For I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth. So I have sworn that I would not be wroth with thee, nor rebuke thee. For the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed. But my kindness shall not depart from thee. Neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed. Saith the Lord that has mercy on thee. 
O thou afflicted, tossed with tempests and not comforted, behold, I will lay thy stones with fair colors and lay thy foundations with sapphires. I will make the windows of eight gates, man, I wish I could preach this, and the gates of carbuncles and all thy borders of pleasant stones. And all thy children shall be taught of the Lord and great shall be the peace of thy children. If you're worrying about your child, great shall be the peace of your child. If you're worrying about your baby boy, great shall be the peace of your baby boy. If you're worrying about your little girl, great shall be the peace of your little girl. In righteousness shalt thou be established. Thou shalt be far from oppression, for thou shalt not fear from, and, and from terror, and for it shall not come near thee. Now watch this. Here's the end of it all. While he has their promise and process. He says, behold, they shall surely gather together, but not by me. He said, he said, behold, oh, you're going to have some issues. They coming, but that didn't come by me. Whosoever shall gather together against thee shall fall for thy sake. Come on, here we go. He says, he says, here's what I know, behold, I have created the smith that bloweth the coals in the fire and that bringeth forth an instrument for his work and I have created the waster to destroy. So in other words, God is telling Israel, there's no need for you to worry about whatever's coming at you as a problem or a predicament, nor people who are trying to gather themselves in array against you because I have created something that could be so devastating that there is nothing that anybody can bring to you that will have the power over what I have already created because whatever is coming at you, I created it. Y'all not in here with I didn't cause it, I didn't do it, but I created it because everything in the world was created by the seed of his word. I wish I had somebody in here. Therefore, since I created it, I got the power over it and it does not have the power over me. So no weapon formed against you shall be able to prosper. So what I just told you is that the promise is going to happen, but the weapon is not going to prosper. Slap somebody a high five and say, the promise is going to happen, but the weapon ain't going to prosper, baby. I wish I had a church in here. What God told me, what he promised me, I'm about to walk into it, and the weapons that's been trying to form against me, they don't have any power to stop what God has already started. I want you to do me a favor tonight, and I want you to stand up for a moment because it is important to know that this is the time of year where the seasons are changing and priorities are changing and energy shifts coming out of winter into spring, spring into summer. But yet and still I feel that some of you are still in the darkness of winter when your season has shifted. You have to stop mislabeling your seasons. <laughs> if you've gone through a dark period where you feel barren, isolated, wounded, it's just a season. It is not a life sentence. And like seasons change, it will change. God's promise is already in process. I didn't need to give you no points. That is the point. So don't miss the point. What, I, what did you learn today at Wednesday Bible study? My promise is in process. That's what I learned. 
I learned that my promise is in process and once God started it, it cannot be stopped. So I'm going home and start and get ready for what he promised. The promises of God are yes and they are amen. The yes is on him, but the amen is on us. And I just feel just in this moment that there are some people in this room who have been out of alignment with what God promised. Because what he said is too big for you to even fathom. And it's hard for you to believe it. It's not that you don't trust God or that you don't have faith. It's just that you're like, are you serious, God? You're going to do that for me? And God says, yeah, I'm going to do that for you. Because I can trust you. I can trust to grow you from here to here so that the birds of the air <laughs> can come and take nest and what I produced in your life so that people can be blessed, so that there can be shelter and cover for somebody else because that's how God wants to bless you. Amen. But the promise has a process. And part of that process is you making a decision, a choice, to start preparing and getting ready for what God promised. A choice to move forward and let go. A choice to be at peace with the paradoxes in your life, the contradictions. Yes, you're confident, but you got anxiety too. But somebody tricked you in believing that your confidence can't live with your anxiety. <laughs> confidence and anxiety can coexist. How do I know? The Bible says, you need scripture, okay. The Bible says, when I'm weak, I'm strong. <laughs> So, so I can have peace, Lord have mercy. I can have peace that surpasses all understanding. And it guards my heart, it guards my heart and my mind. Why? Because at the same time I got peace, I got fear. So peace is guarding my heart and my mind from the other stuff I got. It's a paradox, so you, you have to learn to be at peace with a paradox. Paul said it this way, we have this treasure in an earthen vessel that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us, but we are troubled on every side, perplexed, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed. Do you see the paradox? So I got the treasure, but I also got the trouble. <laughs> I preached that another time. <laughs> but, but it's okay. I got this promise, I got this treasure, and I got this trouble. But no weapon formed against me is gonna be able to prosper. And every tongue that rises up and gets me in judgment, I got the, I have the power to condemn it. For this is the heritage of the children of the Lord. This is yours. This belongs to you. This is what God promised for you. And so while you have your issues and while you have your troubles and while you have all of that, I just want to pray for you. And you don't even have to come to this altar. I just want to pray for you. Because I don't want you to get distracted. 
by all the little insignificant things that's been coming up. Is anybody in this room been dealing with just little nagging stuff that's just been coming up at you out of nowhere and you're like, just, if I could just... Your promise is in process. And I don't want you to get distracted by all of that. Start making room. Keep making room. Keep planning. Keep moving your vision forward. Keep moving your vision forward. Come on, lift those hands right here in this room. Father, I thank you. I thank you, God. What, what they don't know, <laughs> Lord have mercy. What they don't know is that you prescribe this word for them with precision tonight. Somebody needed to hear this. You've been waiting on the Lord and I came to say wait on the Lord and be of good courage. Because they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. You have mounting up to do. Our God, and when you do it, you're going to do it with eagle wings. You got running to do. And when you do it, you ain't going to faint. You got walking to do. And when you do it, you're not going to get weary. Father, I thank you that our promise is in process. And while we wait on you, we will choose to give you praise. We will choose to prepare for what is coming. And when the weapons form against us, we know they will not prosper. And when people rise up in judgment against what you're doing in our life, Father, we'll just condemn it with a word. <laughs> we won't receive nor accept into our hearts, our spirits, our minds, the toxic negativity of other people's opinions. We're gonna stay focused and we're gonna move forward with what you called us to do in Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. I dare you give God a shout of praise for the word of God tonight. Come on, bless them right where you are. Come on, bless them right where you are. Bless them right where you are. Bless them right where you are. Hallelujah. I want to bless you tonight as you leave this place because I believe your promise is in process. Come on, lift those hands right here. May God bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May God be gracious unto you and give you peace. May he surround you with his favor like a shield. May his angels encamp themselves round about you. And may his precious blood cover you from now into eternity. In Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. God bless you. We love you. We'll see you on Sunday morning.